Hello YouTube, in this video we're going to be talking about minimalism. This is a concept that I've already used a ton on the channel and I know I must have confused the heck out of you guys because if you went and googled the term, the only thing that comes up is art pieces, it's paintings and you would have wondered, man, what is he talking about? What does minimalism have to do with training? Well, you see, minimalism is really important in lifting weights in general for any practice because it is extremely prevalent and it's extremely damaging to your gains because it is something that a lot of people fall into and they don't even realize they're doing it. And I think that making a video explaining to you exactly what it is is going to make you just have an epiphany because you might realize that I'm actually describing the way you have been doing things. But you will also see that I'm not just going to make a hit piece against minimalism because if you know the way I think, I don't believe in wrong or correct concepts. I don't think that there are things that should just be ignored altogether. A lot of the time, these are gray areas, like junk volume, for example. Junk volume is not a bad thing. It's a bad thing if it replaces meaningful volume, but by itself, it's not an evil per se. Likewise, for minimalism, it is the same. So let's get into it today. You'll see that a big portion of the video is going to be about straight up programming and training principles, but a lot of it is also going to have to do with philosophies because you know me, it's a topic I enjoy. And in this case, it's unavoidable because it really represents the core of the issue with the concept. So in terms of semantics, I actually have to define what minimalism is at first because I'm going to be using certain terms that you've heard before and I want you to know exactly which meaning I'm actually attaching to each of them. So minimalism is mostly used to describe art, right? It's an art movement that's dated back in the 60s, 70s, especially 70s, especially in the US, which aimed to restore art to its purest expression. It tried to get to make do and make a way with all of the additions that just weighted the pieces, that just added things that were not necessary. It believed in the core concept of an unavoidable portion of what makes art and that this portion by itself was enough for art, for art to be meaningful and beautiful, but by doing so, it also tried to redefine what beauty was. And I would really encourage you to go look up minimalistic pieces of art because it's quite interesting. It actually gave birth to what a lot of people consider to be contem contemporary art or modern art, and a lot of that has devolved massively. And you'll see that for minimalism in the realm of fitness, it's the same. The practice at the start was beautiful, it was interesting but it was turned into something vile and just void of any meaning and interest by people who don't understand the concept. Same for the minimalistic art. Go look at minimalistic paintings. They're beautiful, just enough details to give you the inspiration necessary to actually be interested in the painting, but not enough to actually infer meaning and force you to understand certain things. But it's slowly transformed into just a blank canvas and someone telling you that this represents like life, death, and just God in general. That means nothing, of course. It's the natural evolution of concepts. They just end up dying. They end up in the garbage can. Same for minimalistic training principles. So that's for minimalism by itself. This is what it means. A minimalistic piece of art is one that is going to be reduced to its simplest expression. Look at the thumbnail. That's minimalistic. It's simple, it's white. White is usually associated with minimalism because it is the purest color, quote unquote, meaning that it's not flashy. It's not in your face and it's just void. It doesn't really have any meaning, right? You are the one who are going to actually have to understand the meaning in it. That also means that it's tough to grasp for a lot of people. Doesn't mean that it's better. That would be an elitist mindset and a lot of people who actually train minimalistic tend to have that elitist mindset, but it's different, right? It's, you like it or you don't. I personally really like it. In terms of the sense, the, the, the word minimalist, which is an adjective this time, it's simple, it's someone who practices minimalism, as simple as that, or it's something that is a representation of minimalism or an extension of it. 
So if I'm talking about a program that is applying minimalism, it's a minimalistic program. And then, as I just said, minimalistic. So sorry, I got a little bit confused. Minimalist is the person who is going to write the program and who applies minimalism to their life or crafts. The minimalistic approach is the name that I'm going to give to the thing that this person creates. So we have three terms, minimalism, the practice, minimalist, the person who practices, and minimalistic, the thing that the person practices. Very simple, very easy, but that way you don't get lost. So let's get into the lifting applications. Why do people use minimalism? Where did it actually originate? What is the point of this? Well, it's very simple. Minimalism reduces programs to their simplest expression, just like the art form. Meaning that it's going to try and strip the program to its, to its bone. It's going to try and keep what is necessary and what is most important. And this practice was created just like the actual minimalistic uh, movement as a response to something. Art works like that. Ideologies, political movements work like that. It's the pendulum, right? It's a concept that I like to use. The pendulum swings then it swings back. And when it swings back, it swings back towards the opposite. So a lot of people, uh, it was back 10 years ago, pro were propagating the type of programs that had a ton of movement. The programs were extremely furnished. They were extremely dense. And some individuals saw that and thought, no, that is not right. We need to return to something that is more pure. We need to go back to the essentials because all of what you're doing is fluff. Fluff is a vocabulary term that minimalistic uh, mindsets use uh, and that the minimalists, as we just said, the minimalists use. They use that to describe what they consider to be superfluous. So if someone who is into minimalism walks into your house, they're going to get rid of 80% of the stuff because in their opinion, it's just noise. It's just not necessary. And the mindset that goes even beyond that is that not only is it unnecessary, it hurts meaning that you're doing too much and not only are you not going extra gains from it, you're hurting your gains. That is what someone who is going to try and propagate and promote minimalistic training programs is going to tell you. They'll say, hey, all of that that you're doing on top, this is hurting you. If I remove it, even though it is contological, it is going to be better for you. And it's contological because we have that mindset that is just a purely productive mindset of thinking that the more we do, the better we are. Meaning that the more we do, the more progress we get. That, of course, is untrue. And that, that pioneered, that minimalistic uh, uh, thought process came to actually correct that. It saw a problem. It saw an influx of bodybuilding programs that were just way too big, way too voluminous, and it said, no, you don't need that. You don't need that. Let's slash 40% and you'll be better off. And they were right. Because they have managed to bring the fitness sphere in general back to where it, where it needed to be. Meaning that it needed to recenter and refocus on the basics. Because opposed to minimalism is the maximalist mindset. What you could call maximalism. And in reality, it's interesting because I've personally never heard anyone use that term, maximalism. And yet it is, it has been coined, it is real. Why, do no, why does no one use that term? Well, for one simple reason, everyone but the minimalists are maximalists. Meaning that it's the default, it's the default state of, of mankind to be a maximalist. It's the accumulation of resources nonstop. And it's the same in the fitness sphere. You are a maximalist, most likely. Meaning that you have a tendency when you program to be greedy. You want to do everything. You want to do more, more, more. You want to add stuff. You don't really know why. It doesn't necessarily make you progress faster, but you'll still do it because you are stuck in the mindset of thinking that doing more means that you're going to progress more. And that is untrue. You need a dose of minimalism to counterbalance your maximalism. But that maximalism was seen as the, the devil. Right, by minimalists. They saw that as the beast that needed to be slayed. And they did it. Actually, kudos to them. They did it. They slayed that beast. But the problem is that once the beast was gone, no one was there to balance them. And they had no one to fight left. So what did they do? They fought themselves. 
A pack of wild dogs will always eat its weakest member once there's no prey available. And that's the reason why minimalism has devolved, is because it had struck a balance, but a pendulum doesn't stop swinging. So it swung all the way back, from maximalist to minimalist, to the point where it has become harmful for your gains. And a lot of that has been propagated by strength training, because strength training is minimalist by default. For one simple reason, look and think about the movements, about the sports that use strength as a, judge, uh, as a criteria to judge performance. You can uh, cite powerlifting, of course, you can cite calisthenics, and you can, start, you can also cite uh, Olympic weightlifting. Right? These three I'm going to use as, as examples. These three sports are extremely minimalist. Why? Well, powerlifters, they do bench squat and deadlift. That's what they need to be good at. That's all they need to be good at. And if they try to do good at something else, it would be a waste of time because they are judged on that. So if they were to stray away from that, it would be a waste of time. If you see a powerlifter and he trains biceps three times a week, that's a waste of time. And minimalism corrects that. Minimalism helps the strength athlete recenter on what truly matters because it says, hey, go back to the essentials, go back to the fundamentals. This is your bread and butter. Don't try to add jam. You don't need jam. Stick to bread and butter. Same for uh, calisthenic athletes who are going to repeat the same movement ad nauseum again, 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 and again. That is a very minimalistic ap approach. I made a video about calisthenics. It works. For their practice, it works. And then we have Olympic weightlifters who are the quintessential minimalists. Snatch, clean and jerk. Two things. Two endeavors. Two endeavors that you can spend your entire life chasing. Because minimalism isn't a reduction. It's an expansion. But I'll get to that later. And on the other hand, you have bodybuilders. You have guys like me. And bodybuilders, by default, are maximalists. Meaning that if strength athletes are minimalists by default, the opposite is also true for bodybuilders. Because it is accepted and common to see bodybuilding programs who are just mayhems and chaos of just exercises everywhere, 15 movements for the chest, 20 for the shoulders, supersets, 20 sets, you name it. That's bodybuilding. It's, it's sort of poetic in a sense because the guys who are interested in expanding their body are also applying the same philosophy to their training principles. More, more, more. More is better. Add more. Never take away. Never take away. That's the mindset of a bodybuilder. You never take away. You add. You keep adding. The strength athlete is the exact opposite. Take away. What is not necessary, you cut. You don't need that. Take away. And that makes space for what is truly important. So that's the ideological divide that minimalism rests on. Because you'll see that this becomes important to understand why eventually minimalism just slipped and went out of control. Because so far, what I've cited is not negative. I haven't said a single negative thing about minimalism. It still is a perfectly valid mindset to have. And if you're a strength athlete, you should be, be minimalistic. Because if you're not, you're going to hurt your ability to perform as an athlete in your sport. Because the more specific the needs, the more minimalist the method. And that's also very simple to understand. If you have one pursuit, just get very good at that one pursuit. Everything you do is going to be tailored towards getting better at this, and you're good, right? You don't need to think outside of the box because you need to be in the box to perform, right? That is the reason why it's a prevalent mindset. It's because it works, right? It's, it's rare to see something that catches on and becomes viral without it having some merit. And minimalism has merit. It's the reason why also it invaded the art scene. And it's still a very powerful movement nowadays. It's because it has a strong message. And it makes sense. It totally makes sense. If you look at a program and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I get 90% of my gains from 40% of the program. So why am I doing the rest? If what I'm skirting is just 10%, maybe I can make up those 10% with more sets or reps of the other stuff that already makes up the most of the tonnage, the progression, etc. That is valid. It's normal to think like this. But that quickly devolves. You'll see that it quickly devolves and it, it loses the ability to actually help. It starts to hurt you. 
And that is what I would like to call the athlete versus artist. In the realm of YouTube fitness, there is a divide. It's bodybuilding versus the wood. Because on one hand, you have guys who do things for functions. And on the other hand, you have a few schmucks who do things for form, who care not for nothing about function. It's just form. And by default, these guys end up being a bit ostracized. It's the reason why for me to speak up, speak up, quote unquote, against minimalism is also in a way a natural response, right? It's bodybuilding that is revolting against a state of existence that disallows its existence in a sense, because the bodybuilding uh, method cannot exist and be minimalistic at the same time. It's not possible. But the problem is that, and I know a lot of people have been waiting for this video. I'm making it. I'm thinking about it because it's going to be a very long video. YouTube fitness is powerlifting centric, but in reality, it's more like it's strength centric. And therefore, since you live in Rome, you do as the Romans and you are, you are always um, exposed to minimalism. So as an athlete, that's fine. If you're an athlete, you're going to think, oh, that's okay. But as an artist, it doesn't work for me. It's this form of oppression, right? You're, you're oppressing me. Bodybuilders are the most oppressed. And that's the reason why you might not understand this video, by the way, because you might not see where I'm coming from, because these methods might work for you. But guess what, buddy? I'm going to give you examples that show to you that even as a strength athlete, your minimalistic ways are hurting you. It's not just bodybuilders, it's everyone, because a method that hurts the people eventually devolves into hurting everyone, even the people that actually gain benefits from it at the start. So that's the image I want you to have in your head, right? It's that divide, that divide that is so important. In terms of uh, training principles too, if we're talking about special, uh, specialization, you specialize through specificity, okay? And nothing knows specificity more than powerlifters, for example, who are extremely specific. But in reality, this also means that there is a battleground here. And the battleground is around specificity. Because if you argue that minimalism is a good training method, then you argue that it is because it involves more specificity and less of a focus on things that are not specific. But that mindset only applies to people who need specificity, aka people who are not bodybuilders. So this is the problem too. It's a very normal and common mindset in humans to have. It's the uh, inability to understand that even though something applies to you because it is your pursuit, doesn't necessarily mean that it applies to others. It's uh, what we tell kids, don't yog someone else's yum. Just because you like bananas doesn't mean that the other guy is going to like bananas. And him not liking it doesn't make him wrong. It's a preference. Minimalism is also a preference. It's a preference because it is actually tailored towards your training schedule. But it might not work and it will not work for bodybuilders. I'll explain why. The reason is very simple. Strength athletes train functions. Bodybuilders train form. Strength athletes are going to train a few functions that they're going to pick. For example, squat, bench, deadlift, aka knee flexion, horizontal press, hip hinge. Okay, you can call the horizontal press something else with shoulder flexion, uh, chest flexion, I don't care. Bodybuilders will train their muscles. So when a powerlifter does squats, he's thinking, I am training my squat. If a bodybuilder squats, he's thinking, I'm training my quads, glutes, arm strings, and hips. If you don't think, if you're one of the two I just cited and your mindset doesn't correlate to what I said, there's something wrong. Ideologically, you're not sound. You don't know why you're training. If you're a powerlifter, powerlifter and you're training just to have bigger quads, guess what? Most likely, your strength is not going to go up. And if you're a bodybuilder training just to get a stronger squat, guess what? Your big, your legs, I was going to say your wheels, your wheels are not going to get any bigger. A lot of people disagree with that. I can tell you that it's true because you are misunderstanding basic principles of training. But again, that has to wait. I'll have to wait for the powerlifting video. So that's that. That's the difference. Okay. So I just established that minimalism was something that was propagated by strength athletes for strength athletes. 
but that nowadays is being argued as being the best method across the board, and that is simply not true. But you'll see also that this might not be true for strength. By default, this makes minimalism more tailored towards strength as a gray area, because it's not necessarily true. There are aspects of minimalism that apply to bodybuilders and who don't apply to powerlifters. Because specificity is still important to bodybuilders, and some strength sports need variety. If you look at a top powerlifter, he is not only squatting, bench, and deadlifting. He is being judged only on these movements, but he is not only doing that. And yeah, if you tell the guy, oh, do curls, he might not be super strong because he's not training for curls. But if you tell the guy, hey, do pose squats, you think he's going to magically be super weak because it's not a normal squat? No, because one, the specificity still applies, and two, most likely he trains that lift. You know why? It's specific. He's specializing, he's doing different movements, he's adding variety to the training. Guarantee you, you look at top squatters, the top squatter of the wood doesn't just go to the gym, do, does five sets of squats and goes home. He does more. He has things that feed the lift outside of the squat, because that's smart. That's how you progress for a very long time. And therefore, minimalism even fails in that aspect because it doesn't apply entirely to strength training. But as, a, as an echo, I also must say that specificity still matters to bodybuilders. You need your lifts to be in a line of specificity for the same reason. You want them to keep progressing, but for you, it will be to make the muscles bigger, for a powerlifter, it will be to get stronger. Likewise, an Olympic weightlifter doesn't only snatch and clean and jerk. They do a ton of other movements that carry over. That is anti-minimalistic by default. On top of that, a ton of top lifters reject minimalism because it is reductive. And the term reductive is going to come back. It's very important to understand what I mean. A reduction is not always a bad thing, but a reductive mindset is because the reductive mindset is always going to try and simplify by shrinking. And that doesn't always work. A lot of the time, the only thing you're doing is you're losing meaning when you do that. And it's a mindset that is common. I'm sure that you know people like this. These are the people who refuse to believe that there might be something out there. And just by saying that, I, I mean a thousand things. They refuse to believe that it's something outside of their understanding. And by doing that, they're being reductive, right? Because they are trying by themselves to reduce their scope of vision. But you know what that does? It reduces the scope. And now you can't see on your side. You can't see what's happening. And therefore, you're convincing yourself that the choice that you made was correct. But just because you can see those things now doesn't mean that they're not there. That's the problem. That's the reductive mindset. And if we're talking about mindset, I'm going to say a few words. I'm going to say two words, three words even. And you're going to immediately be able to know exactly what I'm talking about because it's going to ring a bell. And it might also ring a bell because it's going to make you think of you. If you want to spot someone who is minimalist to a fault, just listen to their words. They are going to say these three things. They are going to say, just do this. A sentence that starts with just do this or just do X is usually followed by instead. Because the minimalist is constantly trying to take something, as I said, and reduce it. So if you give him three, he'll make one. If you give him six, he'll make two. Shrink. That's, that's the, the, the life motto of the minimalist. Shrink. And even if someone has a minimalistic approach to life in general, you'll see that they do the same thing. They always reduce. It's always a subtraction, it's never an addition. The problem is that this can become pathological because I have a direct experience with that. I will post a video of me doing an exercise and someone who has no idea of the way I train will chime in and say, oh, just do this instead. Why do you do this? Just do this. One, this again is thinking that their method is the best method, but two, it also speaks to the psyche of these people. Well, they're constantly trying to find a fix, even though there might not be a need for a fix. 
That's an issue. Minimalism came in as a response to a problem. But as I said, the problem is gone. So now it's just going rampant, trying to just solve things that don't need to be solved. That is a problem. Because in a sense, it's like a crazy artificial intelligence, right? If you tell an artificial intelligence to clean a room, it's going to clean the room. But if you didn't code it properly, once it's done cleaning the room, it will not realize that it's done, that the job is done. It will keep cleaning. Most likely it will start, start stripping the walls, destroying the floor, because it has started to misinterpret cleaning for removing. And you're doing the exact same thing when you think like this. You're not fixing programs, you're just slashing them. It doesn't work. That is a poor application of minimalism. Don't let yourself think this way. But the just do this is just, it's classic. And usually I would encourage you to not start sentences with just. It's passive aggressive by default when you talk to someone else. Just a, just a tip, okay, to just see how passive aggressive that is. This also is trying to get less from more, which, as I said, is not necessarily a bad thing. You do want that mindset in training. You want to get the maximum results from the minimum amount of work, but you still have to put some work to get the results. If you start doing no work, you'll get no results. So you have to stop at some point. Another trait is, and I'm going to give you a few of them so that you can actually avoid them as you program for yourself or as you train, Reduced exercise selection, a minimalistic approach is going to always try and shrink exercise selection. If it sees three knee flexions, it's going to say, no, no, you just need one. Why? Because it thinks that by doing that, it's going to promote performance. And it might be correct, but you'll see that in the long run, this is just going to be damaging. It's also going to reduce the workout length. It's going to see two hours and think, eh, Reduce that, it's too long, you don't need two hours, most likely you're doing something that is not necessary. It's a, perform a performance-based mindset that, by the way, is extremely prevalent in companies and just big uh, industries across the world. When they hire people to slash and, and cut budgets, these people are minimalists. They come in, they look at what is pulling the most weight and they just get rid of the rest because it doesn't matter. That might be good in... Uh, wood or making the most amount of money and not caring about the life of people is the most important thing. But when we're talking about training, it doesn't work that way, right? You're not, you're not managing to create benefits for your employer now. You are just removing things that could have helped you. It's the equivalent of someone who fired themselves because they realize that they, they, they are making the company lose money. It's, it's nonsensical, but it's the type of mindset that I see a lot. You also see a shunning of isolation that is incredibly prevalent and is the reason why also I correlate strength training and minimalism because no one hates isolation movements more than strength athletes. Strength athletes, okay, I'm going to also discuss these people who pretend to be powerlifters, who've never did a meet in their life and who just do it because it's a way for them to behave like jerks. Isolation movements are seen as a waste of time by these people for one simple reason. They're not effective. They're not prime movers. So why are you doing them? Why are you training a small muscle when instead you could just be training a bigger muscle or let a bigger muscle recover? Like this is the just do this mindset. Why do you do this when this is so much more effective? Well, have you thought about doing both? Have you thought that doing curls after your squats doesn't take away from the recovery of the squat? And that it's actually better to do both instead of always picking one or the other. It's a very black and white thinking, which is interesting because minimalism is black and white. Like if you look at minimalistic pieces of art, they are usually in that color theme. It's rare to see it outside of it. This is, a, it's, it's an approach that also leads to what I can only describe as a transformation practice. Because I see that it's not just that they don't like isolation, it's that they want isolation movements gone. So they constantly try to modify them to make them more effective. But by doing that, they make them completely ineffective. And the best example I can give of that is the Ripeto Skull Crusher. And if you're an old school guy, you know what, what I'm talking about. Is that Skull Crusher where you have a full movement of the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, and 
the upper back in general, where you let the weight swing back and then you use the shoulders to bring it back up. A ton of people still do their score crushers in this fashion. Uh, the problem is that these aren't score crushers anymore. These are pullovers because you are using the lats to move the weight. And it cracked me up too because I post my score crushers and I see people in the comments think that it's not the right way. When in reality, it is the right way. When you do a score crusher, you want to go into maximum shoulder flexion, then stabilize the shoulder joint and move the elbow. That way, the long head of the tricep is stretched maximally and you use it to move the weight. As long as the shoulders are not moving, it's fine. At the same time, the same people would defend the repertoire of score crusher, thinking that it's the proper way to do it. But bro, you took a single jointed isolation movement and you turned it into a compound movement. It, and you also, I must say that this is interesting because minimalism creates maximalism by its application. Because it's taking something that was minimalistic and turns it into something more grandiose that does more work. Why? You could ask yourself why this is an ideological contradiction. Well, no, not necessarily. Because minimalism doesn't mean that you're always striving for the small, the little. That's a different thing altogether. Minimalism is trying to shrink, right? So in reality, if you take a score crusher and you turn it into a reaper to a score crusher, you have managed to shrink through an expansion, meaning that you have taken the same amount of time, but you've moved tremendous amounts of weights and you've also involved more muscle groups. And what I just said would actually convince some people to do it in that fashion. Because you'll think, wait, I can get more bang for my bucks. Why wouldn't I do it like this? Well, for one simple reason. You're not actually targeting the muscle that you wanted to target in the first place. Is that a surprise? This is the problem of minimalism. You wanted one thing, you shrunk down so much that now this one thing is not even part of the deal. A good example also is the curl. Look at the way a large portion of the strength-oriented YouTube Fitness does curls. They lift the elbows, right? What does it do? It involves the shoulder. What does it mean? You use more weight. Does it mean that the biceps get recruited more? No. And you can show me as much EMG data as you want. It's not correct. Put your elbows to the side, do an elbow flexion, use only the bicep. Tell me how much you can curl. Why do you think your curl strength shot up when you started doing this bullshit? It's because you're using more muscle groups. This doesn't mean that you're recruiting more muscles, or at least it doesn't mean that you're recruiting more muscles of the bicep. You're recruiting more muscles altogether. But at the end of the day, you lost sight of the goal because you've stopped doing curls for biceps. You're doing curls as a full body movement. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. The minimalistic approach that was birthed by powerlifting. Powerlifting doesn't like non-compound movements. So the second it's so, compound, uh, it's so isolation movements, it said, hmm, that's free real estate. I'm going to change that. And they changed it. And now you have people training for looks and aesthetics who follow these practices and wonder why they make no gains. It's because you are following the wrong guys. You're following a practice that you don't understand and that doesn't even understand itself. Because all of the things I'm saying right now are going to be just a revelation for some of the minimalists on this channel. Because I actually think about these things. And you should be thinking about it too because you're preaching it. You're the equivalent of someone who is going around and trying to convert people to their religion. But you don't even know what the religion is about. When we're talking about traits, programming traits that are also minimalistic, we can mention high-intensity training, which I've already debunked. Uh, but it's interesting because HIT is a bodybuilding principle this time. I cannot, I cannot blame and pin it on powerlifters, right? It's, it's, this is homemade, right? It's bodybuilding who made this bullshit up because, of course, it's super appealing to say to someone, hey, you can just do one set you don't need to do four sets, just do one set. And then they made up an entire bullshit scientific jargon around it, which is debunked in 15 seconds, if you know what you're talking about, by the way. But it is minimalistic because it's shrinking again. It's telling you, hey, do less sets, be more intense, even though just with the score crusher and the curl, that is a contradiction. You're doing less sets. 
so you're being less intense because intensity is equated to volume and repetition, right? It's the reason why we use percentages. If you do seven reps at 80%, the reps compound, meaning that if you do two other sets at the same percentage, it compounds too. If you do only one set, regardless of the intensity of said set, it doesn't make up for the lost sets. That should be evident. Like if you, and I'm talking as someone who dropped out of math when I was 14, but that is still evident to me. Of course, high intensity trainers use the bullshit excuse that past the first set, the muscle can't recuperate. So it's just wasted effort. This is again, a purely minimalistic mindset. It's trying to justify an ideology by scientific principles that don't exist and that are disproven on a daily basis by empirical evidence. We can also cite low frequency, the people who want you to train a body part once a week and who tell you that once a week is fine for the rest of your life, which again, makes no sense, but it's trying to shrink down again. It's always this too. It's minimalism is on a certain level intellectually insulting because it's, it's passive aggressive, it's smug, and it takes the wood for a simple place that can always be smaller, right? The more you expand your knowledge, the more complexity starts taking place. These people don't like that, right? It's something that I've noticed too with the people who say, oh, just do this. They don't like the idea that there's something else. They don't like the idea that, oh, he's doing this and I'm not, he must be like, he must be wrong. He did three sets and I did one. It makes me lazy compared to him. Okay, I don't like that. I'm going to flip the script, say that he, what he did was nonsense. You see that a ton. It's an ad hominem in reality. Minimalists uh, tend to point out things as junk or fluff, meaning that they believe it to be completely useless. Like you shouldn't even be doing this thing and they're hurting you. Across the board, that is mostly untrue. Because if you have implemented these things in your program and you keep seeing progress, is that they're good. No one can point them out and say that they're bad, but these people will still try. Why? They're clinging to their ways. And their ways are the ways of small people. Literally, I'm not talking about midgets. I'm talking about people who are small-minded. Nothing scares the small-minded more than a new idea, a new principle, something that might revolutionize their life. You could think, wait, you're actually doing them a favor. You're opening their eyes, but no, 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 no. You're taking them out of their comfort zone now. They don't like that. They don't want that. They're the equivalent of that guy who lived in his hometown for his entire life and never left it. That guy's comfort zone is this, it's tiny. He's a frog in a well, but he doesn't want to live that well. That's minimalism. In reality, a perfect metaphor for minimalism would be a well, because it is confined, it's dark, but you see a tiny bit of life, of light, and you've convinced yourself that the, the entire wood is in there with you in the well. And everyone out, in the, out of the world is just living their life. And you have no idea. That is dangerous. There's also the focus, and this is what I was mentioning when I was talking about the reduced workout length. And all of what I already said. It's the focus on instantaneous strength instead of long-term performance and progression. A minimalist will look at a program and think, okay, I want to be killer on that one set. And anything that prevents me from doing that goes away because that one set is what matters. But in reality, what they say is my performance during that one set is what matters, not the result I get from it. It's never recovery. It's always instantaneous performance. And that is a mindset that is killer for bodybuilding. If you think like this, you are screwed. What matters is not what you can produce in an instant, it's what you can produce for weeks throughout workouts. And therefore, always resorting to the slashing of things that might hurt your ability to be the king of the wood for one movement is going to hurt. It's the reason why you have people, for example, who are definitely afraid of supersets because they think, oh, my, my performance is going to be affected. First off, no. And two, why do you care? Why do you care? You got tonnage through a different exercise. You lost 2% performance. Why do you care? It's made up for by the other exercise, by 
tenfold. Like you made, made up your, your deficit tenfold. And yet you're still convinced that this wasn't worth it. Why? You have actually put all of your stocks into that one movement. And as a bodybuilder, it will kill you. I've said it a ton. Strength work is primordial. But it's not the most important thing because it opens the workout as a preparation for the rest. The majority of the tonnage comes from outside of the strength work. Yes, strength work is important for progression. But guess what? If you slash the rest, what minimalists call uh, fluff, then the program is worthless now because you have removed what was going to drive hypertrophy. So your strength might go up. Cool. Congratulations. You're now a strength. You're, you are now a strength athlete. You have lost your ability to be a bodybuilder because you have stopped growing your muscles and you have stopped training the muscle. See how it works. I think I've, I've helped you understand how you get to that too, because it's not like it's a virus that you catch. It's ideological. You get sucked in. And before you realize it, your thoughts and your word has been changed. Why? Because the mindset is prevalent and you're exposed to it every single day. And a good example of that is one lift a day and the Bulgarian method. They're both focused on instantaneous strength because it works. If you only do one lift a day, you are going to be good on that lift. You're going to be really performant. You're going to progress. But guess what? You're, going to, you're not going to put on much muscle. Same for Bulgarian. I can already hear the Rick fanboys tell me, oh, he's big. He's not big off of Bulgarian. He said it in the past. He does a ton of volume on the side. He is just instinctive in his programming enough. And I insist on the instinctive that he has perfectly managed to marry the Bulgarian method that pushes progression and the volume work that pushes hypertrophy. He has done the two. The, the marriage is complete. But he's been training for 25 years now. You don't. He has an instinct, as I said. You don't. Those methods don't work for you. Be very careful with that. Because you might be doing right now a program that has a ton of fluff. Fluff. And you're going to go in and you're going to do one lift a day and you're going to see massive progression. You're going to think, oh, this was the method all along. No, no, no. This was the method to progress on strength for one lift. But for the rest, you've ignored all of it. I've been saying no, no, no a lot in this video. I just felt passive aggressive today. I don't know why. It's because I'm talking about minimalism. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of these people. But as I said, it comes from a virtuous place because you are most likely running a program that has a ton of things in it that don't matter. That's possible. I'm not saying that everything in the program is correct, but in removing those things, you are going to embrace the mindset that the removal was the good thing. No, the removal was necessary because what needed to be removed was removable. And I've said remove the ton, but it doesn't mean that in the future it's going to be the same thing. And it might even build a thought process that is going to prevent you from adding things to the program because you're going to be deathly afraid of doing too much. In the long run, in due time, you start adding things. It's necessary for progression as a bodybuilder. You need to. Let's dive back into a little bit more philosophy. But before that, a little bit of a summary because I might have lost some of you. So, to sum it up, minimalism has its use. I'm not saying it's bad, but it, it has its use as a tool, not an ideology. You want to make the distinction between the two because I have on this channel preached for minimalism. And if you watch my program reviews, you know that. I have taken programs written by very famous people and I've removed 20%. And I've told you, I actually made the program better. Why? Because I understand the baseline, I understand muscle recovery, and I understand that at some point, doing five different exercises for four sets each of the same muscle is overkill. Infer from that the meaning. What does it mean? It means that you are going to do a number of sets that are necessary to damage the muscle fibers, put you in a recovery state, and progress. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a balance, right? If you did more, you would start removing things that are necessary to, to damage muscle fiber and you would hurt your progression. 
If you did less, you would leave those exercises and also hurt your progression because it would be a waste of time and you would be under-recovered at the end of the day. That is how you use minimalism, right? I've said it in the past, minimalism for leg day works. Why? Because it's efficient. Squats and deadlifts, when you start, will make you grow. No need to do them all the time. You can shrink the frequency. After a while, you add variations. You could add variations from the start if you need variety. And you build up from it. People who stay at the point of saying, oh, just squat and deadlift, bro. These are the people who are in the wrong. These are the quote-unquote evil minimalists. Is because they have failed to let the mindset evolve. And in reality, it's interesting. Their minimalism has turned minimalism into a minimalistic version of minimalism. Shrunk. And now it has lost its meaning. It's the same for a ton of philosophies. Like, for example, Stoicism. A lot of people have such a, a, a shallow understanding of Stoicism that they practice what can only be described as Stoicism Eco Plus. I don't know if you say that in English. Uh, Walmart version of Stoicism. Like, it's only a fraction of what it actually uh, contains. And therefore, it's garbage. It's the same for minimalism. So you want to use it to be performant, to do just as much work as is needed to progress, but you don't want it to become your everything and you don't want it to just dictate your life. Because you might end up in a reductionist mindset as opposed to a perfectionist mindset. Let me describe both terms. I use the term perfectionism, which is often used in psychology as a derivative identity disorder in a sense. I personally use it to describe the observing and bettering of practices, meaning that you're going to look at something and you're going to think, how can I make it better? Not, not how can I make it smaller or how can I make it bigger, bigger? No, how can I make it better? That is going to lead to an expansion, not necessarily of the thing, of the knowledge, although usually of the thing as well, for programs at least. But that also means that when you start the program, you understand minimalism. Because for it to be perfectionism where you add things, well, the bearable in program at the start needs to be minimal so that when you add things, it doesn't become overcrowded. This is the reason why novices get to be minimalist. They get to because it works. Even if you train for strength, you get to be minimalist. But there is also a limit. So for example, take any type of novice program like starting strength. They are minimalist to a fault because they refuse to understand that novices need to train every single muscle group, not just the big three, not just the main compound movements, not just compound movements, but also isolation, an inclusion of sort. Okay. It's key to understand that because you are, as I said, soaked in minimalism everywhere you go. Most programs are like this. Most programs that are going to focus on progression and that a lot of people are going to embrace are like this. And this can follow you a long time. As opposed to perfectionism, we have reductionism. The describing and interpreting instead. So you look at something, you describe it in your head, and you interpret it afterwards. You'll see why it leads to destruction. It leads to destruction because it leads to simplistic programs instead of simplified programs. The practice of perfectionism leads to a simplification of thought. You look at something, you look at processes that are not optimal or unneeded, and you slash them or you replace them. That's the way you program. You always strive towards the better. Okay? Minimalism strives towards the, the smaller. So, for example, if I gave the training program of a top Olympic weightlifter to a minimalist on YouTube Fitness, they will remove 30% and say, hey, look, I made it better. Hand it over to the Olympic weightlifter. He's going to look at you like, is this a joke? How am I supposed to grow off of this? This, of course, stems from the fact that a lot of minimalists tend to speak to novices only. And once you start talking about intermediate and advanced lifters, they're out of their depth because the ideology just doesn't compute with the way programming needs to happen for these individuals. And therefore, they're completely helpless. But a man that is able to say and admit, I am out of my depth, is a rare man. It doesn't necessarily happen very often. And therefore, you have a ton of minimalist gurus on this platform 
who when actually confronted with what can only be described as an existential crisis for their ideology, just double down and say, oh no, it's still right, it still applies, just, just strip, just do squats, or just do squats, it's okay, just do bench, oh, you want big triceps, just do bench. This is where it comes from, by the way. All of that idiocy of people who said, oh, just do chin-ups for big biceps, bro, that's minimalism. It's the, this, listen to the semantics I used, just do chin-ups, just, it started with just, dead giveaway that it's a garbage advice. Also, look at the guy, 100%, maybe 98% of the people who give that advice have shit biceps. So who are you to speak? You have no biceps, you have no triceps. Oh, do bench press for, bicep, for triceps. You have no triceps. Your arms look like stick cheese. Why do you give advice about that? Just shut up and let people do isolation movements the way they should. Minimalism needs to know its place. It doesn't know its place. So that's the two forces, perfectionism, reductionism. You want to embrace one and reject the other. If we're going to dive deeper, we can also say that perfectionism aims for something that doesn't exist in a sense, because perfection doesn't exist. In reality, in programming, in training, perfection means stability, stabilization. You want something that is stable enough that you can now progress steadily which can also lead to chaotic expansion. As I said, uh, bodybuilding is the, the, the endless pursuit of perfection, which leads to people who do way too much. That's true too. When I do program reviews, you see it. I, I just take stuff away because I'm like, no, you don't need to do five different types of cable rows. Just do one big vertical pull and your bases are covered, all right? On the other hand, don't just do deadlifts for lats and wonder why you look small. It's because you're being stupid. That is also, um, with the exercise selection, something that I will denounce in another video, but I saw that a lot, as a, again, with the pendulum swinging back, as a response to minimalism and just one lift a day, people who decided to just, just dump the entire garbage can of lifts in programs and say, oh, this is the response. Like we're going to maximize everything. Well, good job because now you make shitty programs because you're not thinking about how to make things better. You're just engaged in an ideological war of eh, smaller, eh, bigger. These don't work. They don't function. This is childish. We are aiming for progression, right? Anything that leads to that is good. Anything that is not actually leading to that is bad. That's easy. You also see that with uh, perfectionism, it can lead to what I describe as a holding disorder where people collect programs. Like some of you on the channels, I don't know what you think programs are. Uh, Newsflash, they're not Pokemon cards. You're not supposed to have 15 of them. You're not supposed to rotate between them. You're doing way too much. And it's the reason why you're not progressing, by the way. You're not thinking about this the right way. You should apply some minimalism to your life. Reductionism, on the other hand, is the leading principle that believes that you can look at the simplest expression of a phenomenon and reduce it, reduce it to its fundamental every single time. And this, in philosophy, it's just the interpretation of complex systems as the sum of its parts. That's complicated and stolen from Wikipedia. So I'm going to explain what I mean. If you look at the complex machinery, machinery, it is very common for people to try and make sense of it by looking at it unit to unit, by looking at the pieces and not the assemble. Why? Because it's easier. It's more easy to grasp. But the problem is that a lot of people who do that lack the ability to do so, meaning that if you're going to look at uh, the small, smaller picture, you need to have the ability to keep in mind the big picture as you do it. And a lot of people don't have that. So bear with me for a second. I'm going, I'm going to try and paint to you what I mean by this. It's as if you went in and you saw a car. The car is walking, but you have been asked to optimize the car. You are a minimalist. You have already a bias. You're going to go in and remove things. One, nothing is telling you that things need to be removed. Two, things could need to be changed and not just promptly removed. And three, you have no idea what to remove. So you look at the car 
and you take out one piece, the car is still working. You take out another piece, now it works better. Okay, strike off luck, it works better. <gasps> you remove a third piece, it doesn't work anymore. Okay, which piece made the car work better? Is it the second one? No, you can't tell me it's the second one because there was an interaction with the first one. So it's either the first or the second one. Is the third piece removed the reason why the car is not working anymore? No, for the same reason. It had an interaction with the first two. Maybe now you take the, the second piece and you put it back in and the car works. The third piece is not in there and it's still working. You know what I'm getting at here? You are looking at a complex system, a complex mother. You're trying to look at the pieces independently and you lose sight of the mother in general. And on top of that, you don't even understand the way the process works because all of the people who have minimalistic mindsets on YouTube Fitness don't understand programming. Because as I said, they tend to embrace high intensity training. They don't like isolation. So they just don't get it. Okay. The reason why also it's tough to argue with them when you argue with an idiot. Like if you met someone who told you, oh, I'll make your mother feel better. I'll pour water in the circuit or something. And you say, well, that doesn't work. And they say, yes, you can't argue past that because they will not accept evidence and empirical just demonstrations as a proof. But I'm getting a little bit lost here. So that's the reason why the reductionist mindset needs to be avoided because you are essentially missing the point. You are trimming, right? And if we're trimming something here, we're trimming the tree of specificity. The tree of specificity has squats at the top and a minimalist will just cut the top, keep the top and say, okay, squats, it's all that matters is squats. Well, guess what? You just separated the top of the tree from the roots and now the squat is not gonna grow anymore because all of the leaves that fed it are gone. That's reductionist. It needs to be avoided like the play. Now, as a conclusion, because we're reaching the end of this video, Minimalism and its essence is to do just enough to get, to get results. That is a, an appropriate approach to have if you want to use minimalism in your life. You're doing less because you know that by doing less, you're getting more. That is always justifiable. But doing less for the sake of doing less is modern art. What do I mean by this? I said it at the start of the video. It started by people who took away what we call a fioriture in français, the things that is not, not necessary in art, the things that are just too much, it's overcrowded. It took it away and it said, look how much better it looks now. It's pure. The meaning is clear. It's everything. But then people came and said, you know what? If taking away things worked, if we take away more things, it's going to be even better. So they removed more. And guess what? They were left with nothing. They were left with a void. That's essentially what modern art is. And then what does the void do? What does the person who just gave you a blank canvas and told you, oh, it's, it's, it's a great piece of art. What does that person ask of you? They ask of you that you are able to invent meaning that is not there. Just like a minimalist will blame you if you don't make results on the program because it will say, hey, it's up to you to find the results. That is wrong. The program finds the result for you. It's the reason why we bother ourselves with programming. It's going to put down tracks for the train of your progression to go. If there's no tracks, the train is just going to go everywhere and just hit a wall. But then imagine if someone showed up and said, oh, it's not the reason why you fucked up is not because there was no tracks. You just don't know how to actually conduct the train. That's an excuse, of course. But it's one I've, I've heard a, uh, a million times, so I just wanted to debunk it. As a bodybuilder, relying only on progressive overload on one lift is counterproductive because you are essentially removing op uh, opportunities and just options. What is the point? It's like if you had 15 doors in your house and you just bar 14 of them and someone says, why? And you say, well... It's easier to just go through one door. Like it's, I, I just streamlined the process. Okay, cool. But now you don't have access to the other rooms. So you've done something stupid. You start with a canvas, as I said, again, with that metaphor of the art. And you keep adding things, right? That's programming. That's how you should think about your program. It starts blank and you add 
tiny bit, tiny bit, nothing major, three sets here, three sets there, time goes by, you add more, etc. Until you reach what could be accepted as perfection, aka stability. And that stability is a piece of art, and that piece of art is minimalist, because it's doing just enough, just enough to get results. Maybe a little bit here and there that is not necessary, but it's not going to kill you. It's still a minimalist piece of art. You put that in a museum, people are going to observe that and they're going to actually have a good time. Meanwhile, some schmuck is going to arrive. They're going to put a blank canvas next to yours. The only people who are going to appreciate that more than your piece are idiots themselves. And these are the minimalists of YouTube fitness. You don't want to listen to these people, as I just explained. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.